All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So she's helped us out. She's been out to the park. Oh, really? Okay, just a reminder to mute yourself as you're coming in. Welcome to our on-farm composting dirt talk number one, part one of part two. My name is Kelly Henwood, and I am your host tonight. I am the WSU Extension Regional Small Farms Coordinator, and we're located in Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap County. If you're just joining us, welcome. Go ahead and put your name in the chat, where you're coming from, what your farm name is. We'd love to see where people are tuning in from. Awesome. Uh, this class is being recorded and will be available to re-watch on our WSU Learning Library website and also our YouTube channel. So if you pre-registered for this class, you'll get a follow-up email with the link to that. So you can, you can turn back to this reference in the future. And awesome, nice to see you all. I see some familiar faces in the chat. Thanks for joining us tonight. So I've introduced myself. I'll, I'll go into a little bit more of um, my background when I get started, but I'd love to just plug this series and then introduce Bob, um, our other guest speaker tonight. So this is, like I said, part one of a two-part on-farm composting series in our Dirt Talk program that we have in our Regional Small Farms program. This is our virtual class. Part two will be an on-farm visit, an in-person visit at Rockaloo Farms in Port Orchard, Washington. And I'm gonna link the that's, illustration that's right. in the chat. So if you all want to see an incredible compost facility um, and meet Bob in person and meet um, Rolling Bounty Farm, the farm that's farming on the property, please sign up and come to the in-person opportunities. That is where our farmer to farmer networking happens and you get to see a fantastic farm in operation. So Bob, do you wanna uh, come off mute and introduce yourself before we dive into tonight's uh, class? Absolutely. I'm Bob Gilby. Um, uh, I'm, we're, uh, this, this operation is on my wife's um, teenage family farm. Um, it, it's a, it's been in the family for 70 years. You know, we live in a hundred year old house and it's just a delightful down home experience. Uh, we lived in Tucson and we were part, we were part of the local food, uh, movement down there. I have Linda's iPhone is not on mute, but that's okay. So, so when we got up here, um, I, I, I was raised on a dairy farm, and the possibility of becoming a a, 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 a vegetable farm uh, really uh, pulled at our heartstrings. And then the possibility of uh, uh, there was this fellow with thirty horses that said he really needed a place to drop his his manure. And I said, "Yeah, sure." Now, it and it started to pile up, if you could pardon the expression. And I uh, uh, I, I uh, um, uh, applied for a grant. And we built a composting facility. I have composted my entire life, but I was doing it poorly. Took the same course that Kaylee did, uh, Kelly did, and uh, and 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 uh, now we're we're cranking out probably uh, thirteen cubic yards a month of compost that is hot composted, and I love it so much. So looking forward to working with y'all. Awesome, thanks, Bob. So Bob will be presenting a little bit later, but we're gonna start off with a presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And just a reminder, if you all could please remain on mute uh, for the duration of our presentation. And Bob will keep admitting folks into, um, into the virtual class. Okay. Now I'm just gonna turn my video off so I can be not distracted at all. So. Thanks again for joining us. As I mentioned, my name is Kelly Henwood and I am an educator with our regional small farms, um, our regional small farms program. Before becoming uh, an educator with WSU Extension, compost was my background and my passion. I became a compost facility operator by the Washington Organic Recycling Council in 2008. 
and then went on to manage the compost facility at the Evergreen State College Organic Farm. So I, if those of you who are interested in this training, both Bob and I became um, certified trainers. It's an excellent course. You don't have to be a large scale compost facility operator to gain so much knowledge. The more knowledge you have, the better composter and farmer you can be. So big plug for work there. Um, just a, a note that we're not going to be touching or I'm not going to be touching upon vermicomposting tonight. There's a lot of great resources out there on vermicompost, um, but I won't be touching upon that. I'm really going to be focusing this presentation on um, creating and managing and, and utilizing compost on your small farm. So let's get going here. So why compost? Why compost on your farm? I just put up a number of reasons here that I could I could think of off the top of my head. I'm sure there are many more, but maybe explore this question if you haven't started a compost operation on your farm yet. Number one, it encourages healthy biological life in soil. Things uh, with compost incorporated into our soils, we are helping um, things become bioavailable for the plants that we're trying to grow. And we're really trying to foster uh, a, a healthy ecosystem with, within the soil. And compost does that quite well. Secondly, it provides soil fertility for plant growth. It's a source of stable organic matter. We'll talk about what that means later, uh, stable and unstable. It increases water holding capacity in the soil. So as drought declarations are being made and water um, use is becoming more tenuous across our state and in our regions. We want to make sure we are using and capturing water in our soils the best that we can and compost, a stable compost really accomplishes that well if, if used right. Composting is a waste management strategy on your farm. Uh, those of you who are growing crops or have a lot of livestock as you know, there's a you don't sell or use every single leaf in your crop system or every uh, single you know piece in your barn goes somewhere. So it's it's a way to recapture the waste from your farm and work to close close that loop a little more. Composting is absolutely a part of climate friendly or climate forward sustainable farming practices. Um, that kind of encompasses it all right there. It reduces weed germination. There's there's some research around this, specifically when we're talking about mulching or when we're talking about in the soil. And then it can moderate the soil temperature. Again, when we're looking at climate-friendly practices, uh, when we're looking at water retention and moisture content, all of these are really great reasons. You might have some other reasons, so feel free to put in the chat what some reasons you can think of that aren't on this list. I'd love to hear them. So we're gonna keep going here. Okay, before we talk, before we start talking about composting, there are some things that need to be considered. So time and money, right? Composting requires time. It may require money depending on how large or what you're going to do. You may need some equipment, you, you need a certain amount of space, and it definitely takes some time because you have to handle your material, mix it, turn it, and manage it. We'll talk about that. Lack of equipment or just equipment. If you're going to compost on a larger scale, meaning beyond a garden scale, do you have the equipment that's required to deal with it? For example, a bucket loader or a tractor or something larger than a shovel. <laughs> Land. Do you have a place on your property that makes sense for composting? We'll talk about site preparation and site considerations, but do you have space to do this? Odors, odors, how are we managing odors? Do you have neighbors? <laughs> uh, but you're never gonna create odor, right? Because you're all gonna become expert composters. But occasionally, as we know, your compost definitely will create odors here and there. So the question is, um, what's, what's your tolerance for odor? What's your neighbor's tolerance for odor? We'll dive into this a little bit more. We live in the Pacific Northwest, so we need to think about weather and when you're going to be composting, where, uh, considering the amount of rainfall we get here, we'll talk about some rain issues and leach issues 
for storage and curing of compost. Materials, do you have the right materials to make compost or any materials? Will you have access to make a good starting mixture? And we will consider all of these materials. And then of course, what's not on here is the end use. What do you wanna use compost for? Ask yourself, what are some of your goals? Is it the primary fertility and nutrient system in your farm? Is it just a place to store weeds, brush, food waste, or other crop residues or materials? Um, do you have uh, um, perennials or annuals on your on your property, on your farm? These choices will affect what kind of compost you want to use and what scale that you will be operating your compost system on your farm. So the question is, what can I compost? A lot of people ask this. Uh, the answer is just about anything with organic matter or excuse me, with organic material or carbon compounds can be composted. So that includes animal manures, fruit and vegetable matter, crop residues, yard debris, wood, uh, shavings and chips, newspaper, livestock mortalities, fish processing waste, fats, oils, all sorts of stuff, coffee grounds, eggshells, uh, county fair waste or barn cleanouts. So I have the no-no list on here. Um, you can add to your own no-no list. This is my no-no list. Um, and this is a generally accepted no-no list. Cat or dog pet waste is not advised and not recommended to include in your compost system on your farm. There's parasites. The, the recommendation is to bag and throw away pet waste. Thinking about noxious weeds and certain plants um, that you may want to reconsider adding to your compost process, depending on how well managed your pile is. For example, tansy ragwort is not recommended to add to your compost pile. You can refer to your county noxious weed department or your WC extension office if you want to dive into that a little bit more. And then another thing listed on the no-no list is certain disease plants. Certain disease plants that contain soil-borne pathogens, you don't wanna spread around the farm um, or include in your compost that will then be spread around your farm. I put an example of club root in there, which is, if you're a veggie farmer, you're probably familiar with it. It's It affects brassicas and um, it doesn't leave your farm for a very long time. So those are some considerations for what you can compost. So what is compost? Let's start with the definition. The decomposition of organic material caused by aerobic microorganisms under controlled conditions. So you'll notice that the word decomposition is in the word compost, but composting is not just decomposition. It is ma uh, managed under controlled conditions. So basically you're gonna let things rot or decompose, but in reality, composting is more like an active sport that we need to manage. So here are a few pictures um, of composting that's controlled and managed on this slide. At the top, we have these really nice windrows, as we're calling them. They look like great compost. The middle picture, we have a well-contained, really a great small farm pile, which made fantastic compost using pallets, some heavy duty tarping to uh, tarp off this pile, it looks like in the winter time. And then at the bottom picture, we'll get into these examples more, but that's a picture of a um, forced air static pile. So these are great examples. This is not composting. These examples, no shame to any farmer, we've all been there, um, but I just would like to show you all what is and what isn't composting to, to be clear. These are kind of messy piles. They're not really a controlled area. You'll notice we have liquid runoff on all of these examples. Uh, there's some water quality issues there. We do have the basics here of being able to compost, but we're just not following through on a managed process. This is not composting. Okay, so there are generally, we're gonna be talking about two forms of composting today. 
And um, I say common compost systems for small farms. I'm really going to fo be focusing on um, the top two bulleted uh, lists, uh, the top two bulleted points on this list that are highlighted in yellow. Um, we're really focusing on aerobic composting versus anaerobic composting. I'm going to use those terms throughout the presentation. So is Bob. Aerobic just means air. It's turned. It's a turned pile composting. Anaerobic means lack of air. You're not. You're not allowing oxygen in there. We're going to be focusing on aerated static piles and passively aerated static piles. So what is an aerated static pile? This is where you have a pile of material you want to compost with either piping at the bottom of the pile where you're providing some kind of airflow through the pile um, for microorganisms to do their thing and live their happy lives and start composting. We'll talk about some examples of forced aerated static piles and passive aerated static piles um, in a few slides. The other examples are turned windrows or turned piles. So depending on the temperature and depending on your goals, you'll basically mix and turn the material into another pile and just keep doing that a uh, number of times, which we'll talk about. So these are two methods that are used for composting and are generally um, what we want to shoot for with aerobic composting. I put in there ag bag and rotating drum and earth bin. I'm not going to talk about those too much, but just because they're up there, an ag bag is similar to a, um, a large feed bag that some farms use in the Midwest. I don't see a lot of farms use them in Western Washington. Um, and then rotating drums, if you have a really small scale operation or a large garden, some of these examples include a closed drum that you're physically turning to get that oxygen in there. So what is the process of compost? So here is the general diagram of the composting process. It provides energy and stable nutrients for growth of microorganisms, microorganisms, okay? So understanding the process and managing it to your advantage is what we are striving for as a composter or a farmer. So if you look on the left-hand side of this slide in blue, we start with organic material, minerals, water, we do start with microbes. We put it in the pile in the middle and boom, we composted it. Woohoo! <laughs> what did we end up with? Well, we ended up with the same amount of materials, organic matter, minerals, water, microbes. But in that time, we've changed the form of the organic matter. We've reduced pathogens. We've made this into a much easier material to use. During this process, so what's happening is we've the pile has given off carbon dioxide, water, heat. You'll see those arrows going away out of the pile. The pile gives off heat because this is going to get warm from the action of the microbes, which is good because that's what we want it to do. So in reality, you may call yourself a farmer, but you're actually a microbe farmer. So your job is to make those microbes happy and to keep them happy. And you will do this successfully and have fantastic compost. So here is a generalized theoretical outline of how composting works related to temperature. This is a fantastic graph that you all should burn into your brains when we're talking about compost theoretically, but also when you're out in the field, out on your farm making compost, have this picture in your mind. It's quite simple. We have time on the X axis and we have temperature on the Y axis. And we start out, this is the beginning of our compost pile. We start out at ambient, ambient conditions. So we make the pile. We go through these different phases, stages, excuse me, of temperature stages. One is called mesophilic, two is, or B is called thermophilic. And then we have curing and maturation stages and phases. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about 
these active phases of composting and um, get into the science a little bit more. So the phases of aerobic composting. We have the first phase, the mesophilic stage. This is the first stage. You build your pile, you get it going. This is usually moderate temperatures or ambient temperatures, maybe slightly warmer. And this stage only lasts a few days. This is where things are really kind of starting to happen. Microbes are starting to chew on things. Bacteria are starting to get a little happy. <laughs> they start to use the materials as a food source. So they're creating hate, heat, they're creating heat. And then that pushes you to the thermophilic stage, which is at higher temperatures. And I'll get to that on the next slide. After you've composted for a week to several weeks, after your thermophilic stage, you'll get into the curing and maturation stage at cooler temperatures. So um, let's dive into it a little bit more. During the mesophilic stage, breakdown of soluble, ready, degradable compo count compounds occurs. Excuse me. These are what we're going to call cookies, okay? So these are the sugars and the starches. These are the things that microbes easily break down, these sugars and these starches. Because manures, grasses, and such, they have a lot of starches, sugars, and these are all fairly easy to break down. So they go first and that's what's getting the pile going. Okay, so I added the, the graph with the cute little yellow star. This is where we're at. We're at the beginning stages of our compost. Next, we move into the thermophilic bacteria stage. This is uh, these different sets of bacteria. They're entirely different critters. They take over as the temperatures increase. They break down proteins, fats, cellulose, hemicellulose. So these are materials that are a little more difficult to break down than the sugars and the starches. But these particular microbes just absolutely love them. And this is where you get a lot of the heat and the pile really gets going. Uh, this is, you'll see the star at the top of the graph there. This is a, a happy time in composting. You're seeing steam you're seeing your temperatures over 131 degrees Fahrenheit, um, you are keeping those microbes pretty happy. After we go through that thermophilic stage, we come into what is known as the curing and maturation stages. And you'll see the star on the chart there. It really drops down. Um, separating curing from maturation can be difficult sometimes for for folks, they do run into each other in places and time. Organic materials are, are still decomposing during cur curing and maturing phases. And you, you definitely need to give your pile some time to become a finished stable product. I say pile, but you could use the word batch if you'd like. But the point is it needs time to become stable. Uh, for example, immature composts or um, non-stable compost can contain high levels of organic acids, high carbon to nitrogen ratios, high salt content, or extreme pH values. So you really need to give yourself several months to mature and to cure your beloved pile. Uh, don't hesitate to get a compost test. Um, we have some fabulous resources on where to get your compost or where to send your compost sample to get tested and interpret your analysis results. But please don't hesitate to get it tested to make sure that you're, you have the best product for your farm. Okay, so this, let's get back to this uh, stage, the curing and maturation. So these, this stage is really interesting. These are usually dominated by fungi and what's called actinomycetes. So when you pick up soil or well-aged compost and you smell it and you smell that earthy smell, that's actinomycetes that you smell. Um, I am not a scientist in the sense of, of explaining exactly what actinomycetes are. They're like a bacteria in a fun fungi clothing, but look them up. They're really quite interesting and you all have probably seen them before when you 
dig into a compost pile or open up a bag of compost and you see these white fabric like um uh fabric like cloaking um array in there that's those are actinomycetes and and fungi so good things as you can see all of all of the microbial communities are so different from each other but they're all so important to the compost process okay i'm going to switch over to factors that affect composting so there are a number of different factors you need to consider when you're composting on your farm such as carbon to nitrogen ratio, moisture content, oxygen content or control, particle size, pH. The pH is, is how acid or alkaline your material is. I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot about pH, but I put the range in there. You can read more about different feedstocks or different materials being different pH. Um, ranges, but 5.8 to 7.2 is the range you're going for. If your pH exceeds 7.5, it can promote ammonia gas loss. So um, different uh, decomposers like different pHs, like bacterial decomposers prefer um, a certain range and fungal ones prefer others. So that's all I'll say about pH at the moment. So temperature and size of the pile. I want to say, I want to make a comment about a size of your compost pile. In order for ideal microbial activity, you, your pile, your compost pile needs to be bigger, at least bigger than one cubic yard. Um, keep in mind that your finished compost will decrease in size by about 50%. So Knowing that and knowing the compost process, and we'll talk about carbon to nitrogen ratio and all the factors that affect composting, you need to make sure the size and scale of your composting operation um, is, is keeping your microbes happy. So let's dive into that a little bit more. Okay, because you're a microbe farmer, because you're in composting, because you have to make those microbes happy, they require a certain amount of nitrogen and a certain amount of carbon to get happy and start doing their thing. Uh, different materials have different carbon to nitrogen ratios, and that's the amount of carbon to the amount of nitrogen. So at the top here, we have a couple of pictures. The, the cheat sheet is brown equals carbon, green equals nitrogen. So we've got some visuals there. I put in at the bottom, I'm going to be using the term feedstock interchangeably. Feedstock just means raw material. So straw is a feedstock. Grass clippings is a feedstock. And at the top of this chart, the C to N ratio chart, you'll see finished compost is around 15 to 25 to 1 or 15 to 25 to 1. That's the carbon to nitrogen ratio of finished compost. Okay, so let's look at grass clippings, which have a moderate to low C to N ratio. They have 15 parts of carbon to one part of nitrogen. And a lot of times you'll see this referred to as a C to N ratio of 15. It's always 15 to one. It's always something to one. It's always so many parts carbon to so many parts nitrogen. So on this list, we have various materials listed. I should take off biosolids, um, not encouraging farms to use biosolids. This is from a publication for large scale compost facility operators, such as municipalities who do compost biosolids. So, um, Take it off the list. Anyways, food waste, dairy manure, leaves, straw, bark, paper, wood, and sawdust. We go down the list. So these, let's see, you're looking to try to get your compost mixture, mixture something that's 20 to 35 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So you, that's, that's the goal when you're making a mixture. You want around 20 to 35 C to N ratio. So, and these are just book values. So, you know, yours could differ dramatically. 
We have carbohydrates, again, which are the sugars and starches or the cookies. Those are easily degraded. Then we go down the list and we have cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin. These are all plant and animal structures that aren't quite as easy to break down as carbohydrates and then fats and oils. So when we're looking at this C to N chart, uh, a low C to N ratio, what's not on here is chicken manure. I wish chicken manure is on here because that's our best friend. Um, chicken manure would have a very low C to N ratio and maybe Bob has it off the top of his head and can put it in the chat. Um, but you go all the way down to wood and sawdust, 500 to one, that is a lot of carbon. That's a lot of lignin. That's a lot of plant material that is really difficult to break down. So it takes a lot more time. So when we're thinking about our compost material mixture, our C to N ratios, we really want to keep in mind the feedstocks that we're using in order to, again, make our compost process um, successful and our microbes happy. Okay, so over time, you know, the question you're probably wondering right now maybe is how do you determine this? Over time, it really will become second nature if it's not already, but a lot of people just guesstimate. Uh, you could use your eye, you could use a five gallon bucket or a wheelbarrow to quote unquote measure your feedstocks or your pile. But a good rule of thumb is one part green to two parts brown. One part green to two parts brown. Basically, you just need to take away from this that if you have too much of one feedstock, your compost will take more time to break down or might not break down properly or could go into anaerobic conditions, which we don't want. So now's the time I'd love to hear from other farmers in the chat. I'd love to hear how you all approach making a compost batch or mix and just how you measure. Just so we can share knowledge in the group, feel free to type in the chat. And I'm going to continue on um, the C to N concept as we go. So looking forward to seeing what you all write. I do want to highlight this pretty awesome resource from WSU. If you want to get a better sense of C to N ratios or get more of a precise mixture, mixture if you're a big fan of spreadsheets, we have what's called the WSU Compost Mix Calculator. Thank you to the researchers at WSU Puyallup and other extension research stations. They created this spreadsheet or app that is really quite easy to use. It's It basically calculates a C to N ratio and moisture content for you based on which feedstocks you tell it that you're using and the proportions that you're choosing. Yeah. It's pretty handy. Um, I'm definitely... I'm happy to do another presentation using just this. If if people are interested, we could we could get into it a little bit more. But one thing I really like about this spreadsheet is you can um, you can use it to check if the materials you have on hand will actually make a suitable mix for composting, or if you need to change proportions. Alexa, what's the notification? Could you all please mute? return for each loan was received and a refund has okay please mute yourselves thank you very much awesome okay let's keep going here so the next thing we want to talk about is moisture all of these fantastic happy microorganisms require moisture to survive so microbiology speaking your compost needs to be kept moist to keep them happy and to stay alive but not too much, it's kind of like Goldilocks. You wanna basically have a thin layer of film around each particle in your compost pile so that those microbes can move. They can literally physically move around in that little layer. The moisture range, you know, the book value is 60, or excuse me, 40 to 60 or 65% by weight. But, you know, your, your question is, well, what is that? What is, how can you tell what that is? You can do something called um, calculating bulk density, but there's resources about that, but we're not gonna go in that, into that tonight. We're gonna keep it a little more simple. Simple as in the squeeze test. We do have a test that you can use to determine how much moisture is just right. So just to remind you, if it's too dry, microbes aren't happy, they can't move. 
They can't break down organic matter, which is what we want them to do. Alternatively, if it's too wet, we don't have enough oxygen. And then we're, we're going into an anaerobic phase and that's what we don't want. So we're trying to find that sweet spot. When we're anaerobic, we it's interesting that the type of microbes actually change. There's an entirely different set of anaerobic microbes that produce some of those foul odors, stalls out composting. That's not what we want. So to do the squeeze test, you grab a handful of your compost mix. You've mixed your compost. You've added water if you needed to. And you want to squeeze it as tight as you can. If you get a couple of drops of water coming out the bottom, you've hit the nail right on the head. If you get a, a stream like this chap in the picture, it's too much moisture. Although I will say it, it just depends on your feedstocks too. Sometimes you do need to start with more water just depending on if you have a lot of carbon in your feedstocks, but generally that's the rule of thumb. And this is a great method in the field to test moisture content. A little is good, a lot is not good because you're basically drowning your, your microorganisms. This picture I liked because it was a smaller scale. I think this is actually finished compost, so maybe not the best place in the slideshow, but uh, this is how one small farm just covers their curing and maturing compost. But I like this because they're, they're tarping it, they're covering it from rain. Uh, one thing about moisture, not in your pile, but we have rainfall in the winter. We want to prevent leaching or too much moisture during rainy season. If you're making your compost in the winter time, um, you really want to manage your moisture where it's coming from. Located near a water source. Actually, what this means is referring to if you have, uh, if, if you're near a water source or if you are um, have a hose or a, sp a spigot nearby. But again, just think of like a wrong sponge. That's That's the feeling of our squeeze test compost. Okay, the next two slides are a lot of information, but they're, they're good. So we're going to talk about oxygen, particle size, and aeration. Oxygen management is really, really important. You have a compost pile we're talking about. We're talking about going aerobically rather than anaerobically. We've touched upon those, those terms. And there are a number of reasons uh, for these, an these anaerobes that make odors, and it is a much slower process compared to an aerobic process. So with an aerobic process, you're using oxygen as the energy source. It gives off carbon dioxide, and it will have that more earthy smell initially. As compared to an anaerobic compost pile, so without oxygen, Microbes are using things like sulfur compounds or hydrogen sulfide as an energy source. And what happens is that you make hydrogen sulfide, you give off water and you give off hydrogen sulfide gas. And that's that stinky sulfur smell you get from an anaerobic compost pile. If you have grass clippings that, you're, that you've poured onto a, a pile and the pile's gotten too big and it's gotten warm and you haven't done anything about it or turned it, it's getting slimy, it's getting kind of nasty, hydrogen sulfide. <laughs> the nice thing about knowing this is after you've made your pile, if you've done it right, depending on what your feedstocks are, you'll smell it or not. So I like this slide because here's a theoretical um, graphic about particle size and structure, um, those circles that we're looking at on the right-hand side. It's a little, It's a little bit of a spectrum. We have various sizes and structures, and you really got to think about those feedstocks, what you're dealing with. So on the, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but on the right-hand side, we have those tightly packed varied size, okay? That is a feedstock like chicken manure. That's going to be something with really small particles, all about the same. We have Bigger particles on the left-hand side, the loosely packed, well-structured, um, uh, and then in between, okay? So is there much chance for air or water to move around in the chicken manure pile, the tightly packed? Probably no, not very much. So you've got to do something to break that up. 
Uh, when I mentioned bulking agents or bulk density, you need some feedstocks that offer some bulking in your pile to allow airflow and water flow. Um, so the loosely packed, well-structured circle on the left there, that, for example, that could be yard debris, like twigs and straw and county fair waste would fit into that. Uh, by the way, if county fair waste, if those of you who do collect that, uh, has lots and lots of air. It's a very, um, it's good for bulking agent, but there's a lot of carbon in county, county fair waste. And then you have the two circles in the middle that, you know, range from being tightly packed, being loosely packed. And what you want is a combination of all of these together so that you have a nice structure that gives you some air channels, again, some water holding capacity, a little bit of small and large particles so you can keep things moving. These are definitely important for not only porosity, but of course, aeration. So some other examples of bulking agents are sawdust or wood chips. Um, maybe some of you have other examples that you use. And then the image of the green bin system, I put this in here just for a visual when we're talking about aeration. That process of moving compost through the bin system is an aeration process. It's a, it's a type of aerating your pile. Um, so we'll, let's get into temperature and then we'll talk a little bit about compost systems here. Temperature. I apologize if this slide is, is busy, but let's let's break it down here, okay? Temperature, this is one of my favorites and extremely important. So I can't see you all, but I'm gonna ask you a question. Feel free to raise your hand, put it in the chat. How many people compost already here? Okay, I'm, I'm assuming you're raising your hands. How many of you own thermometers, compost thermometers? Hopefully, they are equal hands. <laughs> a lot of people will compost, but they won't or they don't use a thermometer. Owning and using a thermometer will help you so much in your compost process. It really helps you determine what's going on in your pile. And we're going to talk about some of these uh, top three points, the process to further reduce pathogens, We'll touch upon organic standards, and we'll touch upon what's called the produce safety rule and, um, and why temperature matters when it comes to these three bullet points. So temperature, as you know, is really important. It's not just for the composting process, but also for something we refer to as PFRP, PFRP, or the process to further reduce pathogens. And this step is a pathogen reduction step. So I hope you all walk away like chit-chatting PFRP. It's just rolling off your tongue. You know, talk to your friends about PFRP. It is the, the term to know, the process to further reduce pathogens. If you're dealing with any animal manures, this is really, really, really important because you're all farmers, you're all growing crops, you're making food, you're growing food. You don't wanna get yourself sick your community sick, your customers, your kids. Um, if you're dealing with manure, there are all sorts of pathogens in manure. At the bottom there, there's the most common ones I've listed, E. coli, salmonella. These are some that make the paper on a regular basis and they're all found in manure. Then there's Giardia and some other scary ones. Those are also found in manures. So now we're gonna deal with how do we reduce these pathogens? There, there are two uh, ways in which they're usually accepted. There's We talked about the turned pile method, and then we're talking about the aerated static pile method. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this right now. So let's focus on the red box on the slide here, okay? With a turned pile method, that's where you have a pile or a windrow and you turn it. You have to have at least 15 days above 131 degree Fahrenheit. And within those 15 days, you have to turn your pile five times. You have to have five turns because basically what you wanna do is 
You want the outside of the pile to become the inside and the inside to become the outside. So everything gets a chance, gets a chance to get hot and die. It may take you more than 15 days to get to this, however. So these are not consecutive days because when you turn your pile, what's going to happen is the temperature may drop the next day. So you may not count that day. It may take you, I don't know, 25 days before you get temperatures that fall into this category. Okay, so that's our turned pile composting. Now with our aerated static pile or what's called, what can be called an in-vessel composting, it has a little bit of a different rule because basically it already has a cover on it. So you need to have three days above 131 degree Fahrenheit and you've met your PFRP, your, path, your uh, process to further reduce pathogen, okay? So why is this? So this is, this is important because when we're talking about organic standards, for example, a lot of folks refer to the US, or excuse me, the national organic standards as the recommendations for managing compost. It's a safe standard. It, it um, the Produce Safety Rule and the Food Safety Modernization Act and the FDA recommend if you're following those protocols, um, you're creating a, a safe use of compost on your farm. So depending on what kind of composting you wanna do, it will depend on where the system fits into the realm of this. Some farms need and want to produce a ton of compost. So they want that three day above 131, boom, they're making compost. Other farms are okay with that month long process of 15 days above 131 and turning it five times. It all depends on the, the goals you have and the choices you make. So the third, the third um, point up there, I talked a little bit about the produce safety rule and biological soil amendments of animal origin. If you want another fun thing to leave this class with, Basau. Say Basau, PFRP and Basau. I just became a uh, certified produce safety trainer with the uh, Produce Safety Alliance. So I am able to provide education and support and technical assistance around the produce safety rule. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what it is, it's basically under the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is part of the Farm Bill. And it requires certain uh, farms, th th if you're in a certain threshold, you are covered on this rule and you have to follow these protocols. Um, if you're using biological soil amendments of animal origins or basows, um, you know, you have to follow these, these procedures and um, make sure that your soil amendment does not include any form of human waste. And I can talk more about that later, but at the same time, you'll have a lot of resources included in your resource list about that. So I'm not going to dive into the produce safety rule anymore, but please um, take note of this if, if you're growing food to sell to the public, regardless of your scale. And my favorite, keep records. Let's go back to that slide. How are you going to know that you turned your pile five times? On which days? How are you going to know what your temperatures were after each turn? Well, you keep records. This is a great example from the organic standards, USDA organic standards. Their handbook has a ton of amazing templates for record keeping, but keep records, keep records, keep records. You will be a better farmer for it, not just for composting, but record keeping is just a part of farming. So make those systems, okay? Um, above all, you want to know not only the conditions of your compost and your fertility and your nutrient man management on, on your farm, but you also want to keep your customers and the public safe. So no one wants to get sick. This is a fantastic template. You can write your date, when you turned it, what your temperature was, who did it. Boom, you have records. Keep records. Okay, the last few slides, I'm going to quicken my pace a little bit so Bob has more time to share. But I'm going to touch upon a, a handful of compost systems as examples for you to look at. So let's move forward here. Site considerations. 
If you are building a new compost site or facility on your farm, or maybe you're expanding your facility, you definitely need to take placement and site con considerations. Um, thinking about them ahead of time will save you a lot of headaches down the road. So these are these pictures are great. This is a example of a compost system on a small farm, a bay, open bay system. It's during the winter. Compost piles are made. They're covered to keep, you know, some some ratty tarps with holes in it. That's okay. It keeps the rain out. Love it. Um, you want to think about where your water sources are on your farm. I touched upon this, but let's talk about it a little bit more. Build your, your compost facility system away from any surface water or wells or any water source because things do leach and leaching tends to happen during the curing phase and the compost storage phase. Okay, so leaching of nitrates and other soluble nutrients is most likely to occur during that phase. Additionally, you wanna keep your compost site way above any seasonal high water table. So keep close to keep close watch of where your water is on your farm. Um, proximity to a water spigot. You are gonna have to water your pile here and there. It's gonna be not, it's gonna be dry. You're not gonna have enough moisture. Do you have water spigots? near your compost system, it's so important. Think about the site that you wanna have your compost uh, facility on. Is it flat? Is it sloped? Uh, folks usually recommend like concrete or, or gravel or some kind of compact soil. You don't wanna put it on your highly porous soil sites. Um, we wanna think about our natural resources when we're composting. Is it easy road access to, are people dropping off feedstocks for you like angels, like Bob will talk about? Or can your tractor, can you easily load it into your truck? Think about access. Handling, how do you, how are you gonna handle? Is it gonna be ease, easy or difficult? Um, do you have neighbors, right? Where do you wanna build this near your neighbors? Look into some county, county laws around compost facility rules and regs that might be out there. And then the time of year, when do you generate your feedstocks or when are feedstocks typically available for you? Are you gonna be composting all winter long and in the spring um, or during the high peak of crop production? So if, if you all have livestock and barns that you're scooping out, think of the time of the year. Okay, so I talked a little bit about aerated static piles. I feel like I've mentioned them way too much. So we're going to talk about the importance of aerated static piles. So we have a, if you look in the picture, we have a blower here that is forcing air throughout the pile. This blower uh, comes, goes down into two pipes and the pipes have holes in them about a quarter inch and at different angles. And in this system that's in the slide, the blower cycles on and off with the timer. It's all timed and it gets heated up to a nice temperature and you can change your air timing based on what your pile is doing. This is a, a great system. I mean, some of the benefits are it changes your PF, PFRP time from 15 days to three days. Okay, so there's definitely a difference in the amount of labor. Maybe up front, it's more to create the system, but in the end, you don't have to turn it five or six times. That's a personal decision for you to make. You also have to have electricity or maybe there's some uh, snazzy solar systems out there. But one of the downsides of this is you have to have the moisture content right from the get-go. Because if you don't have that moisture content right, um, it's too dry, you would need to rebuild your pile. So sometimes starting with a too wet of a pile works in your favor for these forced aerated systems because if your pile gets too dry, there's really only one way to troubleshoot that and it's to un unbuild the pile and rewet your compost and start all over again. So something to consider. Uh, other considerations are disposable materials. So you have plastics, you have some you know other things, uh, materials that you may have an upfront cost and they might break over time. Alternatively, the passively aerated static pile, which Bob's gonna talk a lot more, so I'm gonna blow through this, but Passively aerated piles promote convective airflow throughout a pile. Basically no electricity is needed. 
It's passively aerated. Um, the example in the picture is at the WSU Research Station in Puyallup in an old silage pit. There's four inch pipes with holes drilled in them and they are laid at an angle in, in the pile. And the pile is um, a bucket loader is pouring down compost as the tubes are being laid by another assistant. The key to this system though, this is a great system, but the key to this system is making sure that you have a thoroughly pre-mixed compost mix before you place them on the pipes. So you're not gonna be able to churn this you know, with those pipes in there. You wanna make sure you have everything thoroughly pre-mixed ahead of time. Um, and then sometimes temperatures can be somewhat challenging in this system where you have to have some insulation on the outside of the pile with some finished compost to ensure that thermophilic uh, temperature range. So it's pretty interesting. And turned windrows, I love turned windrows. If you have the space on your farm, this is a fantastic method. These are some great pictures here. They're, they're very different. You've probably seen them before, but um, in the slide, it's, yeah, takes up space, yet they're controlled. You see that they are a uniform pile. They're a, un or excuse me, a uniform windrow. They are um, controlled and managed. I will give someone extra points if they can tell me what is challenging about one of these pictures and why. Feel free to unmute yourself if you are so bold. No takers. Okay. One of the pictures is it looks like there's a ton of weeds growing in between the windrows and I like this visual because this farm has this fantastic finished compost, but yet it looks like some weeds are gonna go to seed and flower soon and go to seed and then have weed seeds on the top of their pile. So just yet another consideration with windrows and management. Here are a couple more different systems. These are turned bin systems. I just love these pictures. They're pretty self-explanatory. The one on the top left is a NRCS compost design build. NRCS is the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service. They do have some cost share funding and some compost design um, assistance that they provide. So contact your local NRCS office, again, in the resource list. But this is great. It's covered. There's these ecology cement blocks, um, a ton of room for a bucket loader. You have four bays. You'll see it's poured concrete. So there's just some uh, management of leaching there. Um, and then some of the other examples are, or considerations in these examples. If you have a bucket loader, if you're using a tractor, you need to think about the size of your bucket loader. The example in the bottom left with the poured concrete, um, the this farmer did a great job, but it's too, it was too small, not wide enough for their bucket loader. So rendering it kind of useless for their system. So think about, uh, again, equipment and size that you're gonna be using in your system. And then the last picture on the bottom right is just great because this could be either a garden setup or uh, a small, really small scale veggie acreage grower. I mean, it doesn't have to be fancy. My last slide, I just wanted to throw out there that if you are a livestock farmer or you are doing any slaughter or, or processing of meat on your, or livestock on your farm, meat processing, there's a fabulous resource that WCU Extension has all about on-farm composting of large animal mortalities. Um, I just pulled an image from it, um, how to build a pile and, and compost your large animals. There's definitely a, a way to do it and a way to do it successfully. Um, I will shout out to our WCU Extension folks who helped uh, lead some of the avian flu mortalities um, and composting with the, with the state vet. So a lot of great stuff in there. And again, that'll be linked in the resource list. And that's my last slide. Thank you so much. Bob, I'm at 55 minutes. Oh my goodness. Hey, when you when you hit your stride, it's kind of hard to uh, 
<laughs> to to take a break. So, uh, oh, so okay. So I guess I can share my screen, can I? All right. Unless there's any questions before. Oh yes. While Bob's getting that um, loaded up, are there any questions from folks? Feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like. I have a question. Um, my name is Tiffany. I, I work at Salish Roots Farm for the Squaxin Island tribe um, in Mason County. And I was wondering if either of you are going to talk about um, just like the active part of adding to your compost pile. I feel like this is such a simple thing that I always feel silly to ask about, but like at what point does like, you know, these stages that you're moving through A through D, like when do you stop adding and then like you are going through the stages? Because our excess waste, we just like pile it on and we just we just add it to this pile um, that we call our compost pile, but I don't really think it's compost at this point. And we just like continue to add and add and add. And I'm like, when should we stop? Bob. I'd be happy to address that because uh, my compost originates in a variation on that very theme. Um, my soul, and Kelly mentioned that I, I had a gift out there in the world, and it's a, a, a horse stable with about 30 horses in it. And, and he accumulates his manure in his own bunkers, his own, uh, they're not composting, but when I, I have a, he's got the horses and, and the dump trailer, and I got the tractor and the acreage. So we make quite a symbiosis. Uh, so when I go over there, his his helpers have been cleaning out stables and and paddocks and and and, and corrals and piling it into uh, into his 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 operation. Uh, so it accumulates rather slowly, but when I get over there, uh, I've seen 150 degrees in in his pile uh, of, of just a stockpile. It's not even intended to be a compost. Uh, so when I move that, um, I take one of those batches like 18 cubic yards, and I put it in one of my bunker slots. So although he accumulates a piece at a time, I batch it when I receive it. So one thing that you can do is accumulate in a repository and have your composting um, a container or operation and say, okay, it's time to create a batch. And you fill your, 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 your compost processing device with, with what you've accumulated. And then you start accumulating again and let that batch cook. Hope that helped. Yeah. Yes, thank you add, so much. Thank you, Bob. I'll just add that, I mean, if you are following organic standards or um, other certifications, or you just want to ensure that, that that 131 temperature is met, you're really not supposed to continue to add to your pile once it's started, like Bob mentioned, it's batched. So starting and creating a pile um, from start to finish is the goal. However, there's gonna be some troubleshooting that might happen. Maybe a pile just stalls out or something's going wrong, which Bob will talk a little bit about. Um, then you, you can add materials then, but that's the general recommendation. Yeah, because the last stuff in there uh, is green. If, if if I can misuse a, a composting expression, it's uh, it's just accumulated. It hasn't seen its PFRP profile uh, that it, that it needs. But if you batch it up your accumulations, and then say, okay, this batch is going to start composting, and we're going to start our PFRP record keeping, then it'll be just fine. Mm -hmm. And I, I've got some uh, I've got some uh, uh, temperature and time graphs in my presentation. And uh, <laughs> if you choose to come out to Rockaloo Farms, you will see it in process. Um, so um, anything else? Any other questions? I see some questions in the chat, Bob. Maybe I'll answer them as you get your presentation started. So you have plenty of time. Does that sound good? Yeah. I, my presentation is hot and ready to drop. Okay. Take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kelly. So. Um, Rockaloo Farms, we're here in the 
uh, southern uh, county line of Kitsap County across from Pierce County um, and uh, certified compost facility operator. My wife was, uh, she knew I was so proud of that, that she, uh, for, for one of my birthdays, she had it turned into a four by eight uh, vinyl uh, banner and it hangs off of my facility. It's, it's really cool, <laughs> right alongside the road. So, um, come on, uh, space. How does this, uh, does it, are you not seeing my screen? We see your screen, but it's not forwarding. I had to I had to use my mouse to click click forward. So maybe you try that. Let me see here. Okay, that's how it goes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, what's the purpose of composting? Um, I like to refer to it as reverse photosynthesis, and that helps understand what we're doing. We're creating a a, a space so that reverse photosynthesis can carry out on its own. Well, it breaks down high, uh, complex hydrocarbons which include plant components. That's the organic matter of plants. It also breaks down the pathogens. I mean, they're just big uh, hydrocarbon compounds and those bugs chew right on them. Uh, partly it's heat, but partly it's just they get, they're food for bugs. Uh, hormones and antibiotics, those are always good to, to have chewed up again, complex uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, pesticides and herbicides are also complex hydrocarbons. And whatever pesticides and herbicides or antibiotics that are in that manure, they don't slow it down at all. I have a lot of empirical evidence that it does just fine. Stabilizing nutrients. It stabilizes nutrients so that when you put it on your plants, those, those nutrients don't, don't immediately go into the plant and overcharge it with, uh, with, with nitrogen um, and, or other, other items. And it creates humus. This really mature, stable compost is exactly brown stuff when you put a shovel in the ground in a, in a big sod field. It's just humus, and it, it, but, but it's time, uh, time release uh, vitamin pills for the, for the plants that are growing around there. Okay, reverse photosynthesis, what does that mean? Well, uh, photosynthesis, uh, carbon dioxide and, 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 and water, chlorophyll and sunlight, uh, the carbon dioxide and the water come up into the plant and the plant makes sugars and pictures the excess oxygen out the pores. And uh, we, we benefit from that. So what is composting? Well, just imagine the reverse. It starts with hydrocarbons, uh, the organic matter in our feedstocks, uh, combines it with oxygen with our airflow, and it creates uh, water and carbon dioxide. And uh, so it's, it's, it's really amazing how I've always thought about putting a column of, of compost into a greenhouse and just let the cycles go round and round and round. But I haven't got to that yet. Types of organic decomposition. Aerobic consumes oxygen, produces CO2. Now, there's the first anaerobic. It's a digester and it produces methane. The third anaerobic is fermentation and it produces acid. Uh, Think, uh, think uh, uh, sauerkraut for this one. Now, I, I, I like that, 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 that graph that, that Kelly did because we went to the same course and we have the same stuff. But there's those two, those two temperatures in there. The PFRP is at 131 and the beginning of thermophilic is 113. Well, I wonder, how did they come up with such precise temperatures? Well, it turns out if you uh, convert uh, 131 to Celsius, it's 55. If you convert 113 to Celsius, it's 45. So the, 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 the truth of the matter is uh, some studies were done. They determined some close temperature in Celsius and they run it to the nearest five degree break. I, you know, that's, and then they convert that to Fahrenheit and they say, it's gotta be 131. Nah. So if your pile is, is like 130, you're probably in pretty good shape. I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. So that's what that comes from. Um, let's see, there you go. Now, this is one of my prettiest batches. So this, this is really a, a, a schematic of how I move my material around. So the blue line is the front of uh, the pile at any given time, and the black is the rear of the pile. Now, way over the far left-hand side, that's when I receive it in the yard. And you can see it's 120 degrees because it probably started out at 150. And then when I sprinkled it into the dump trailer, it got cooled off. So it, it, I start taking that temperature as soon as it hits the yard, 
I can I take it every day for the first uh, three four days because it's going to move fast. And look at how hot it got in the pile in the yard, 168 or so. And then I, at some point, my primary bunker came available and I moved it and it dropped down to 130 because I sprinkled it in there. It's kind of like what Kelly was saying about you, you just want to aerate it really well. Uh, I don't want to put a bump chunk in there. I want to sprinkle it. Um, and then immediately, like as two days is immediate, it went up to 180. And then it tapers off as the time goes on. And then I put it in my secondary uh, uh, bunker. And it, it went various ways. That might be the moisture difference, hard to say. Uh, but they had the same number of degrees above PFRP. Um, and then I put it in the curing pile, which is, which is uh, it has a tarp over it to keep the weed seeds off. But it cooled it almost down below 130, 131. And then it tapered off and I quit taking temperatures when I needed to put another batch into the curing pile and I couldn't reach it with the thermometer anymore. So this had probably 90 uh, days above 131, 90 of them. And look at the number of turns. There were like five turns. The first one was when I brought it to the yard. And the next one was when I put it into the primary. The next one was when I put it in the secondary. And the last one I was when I put it in the curing pile. So uh, that, that I, I count four. Yeah, there's only four there. There's not uh, five like you do with a uh, with a uh, uh, with a windrow. So I do four turns and ninety day ninety days above 130, uh, 131. And so I'm going to say I'm I'm pretty safe. Um, but I love taking these temperatures. Uh, I have the pictures in my computer. And if somebody says I'm organic, I need proof that you have had a PFRP. I say, well, let me give you the folder that has all the pictures from that batch and the graph and uh let me know if there's something else you need okay it doesn't always go that well so um this was batch 50. you can say bob did you go away well yes the fact of the matter is i did uh my wife and i came up in tucson and we were down to tucson uh over the holidays to see family and and and, and friends and that sort of thing and but even this one had like 60 days above PFRP, front and back. So um, uh, it looks erratic, but it was it, it had the data to match it. So I'm, I'm, I'm less concerned. This is like batch 43 of oh, better. I just, just got to tell you. Air supply. Infiltration. That was the first, uh, when I first had my bunker built, I did not have any aeration system put in. I went to a couple of workshops uh, that said, oh, here's how you do uh, aeration. You put these troughs in the bottom of your filter, uh, bottom of your bunker, and you, you put a blower in the back and uh, uh, turn it on for a minute every hour, and, uh, and, and it'll be just fine. Passive aeration, that's what I currently have. Uh, and I'll show you a picture related to that. Then there's forced aeration. That's where you have the blowers. And uh, uh, I, I was on a I was I was on a webinar for Basau Biological Soil Amendments of Animal Origin, and I was mentioning that I had some of these higher temperatures. And one of these one of the sponsors says, "Oh, you got to watch out. You're going to be losing your nitrogen." And another one says, "Oh, you got to watch out. You're going to be setting it on fire." And I didn't say anything, but as I was out at my operation uh, a couple of uh, about a week later, I was thinking I was just imagining that composting happening in there and the, the the nutrients go through two stages first the breaking apart of the complex hydrocarbons and the other is the uh, until the, until the nitrogen is actually mineralized what that means it's in ammonia okay it has been separated from its carbon and and the second stage is reassembling it into a stable uh, uh hydrocarbon called humus so uh, all that uh, ammonia lives in those little air spaces in the pile well if you blow that for a minute and you exhaust all the air guess what goes away ammonia so that's where the nitrogen is lost i i don't do that so my i can't imagine uh how i would lose my nitrogen with too high a temperature if i'm not blowing it out of the pile uh, the, the other part is 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 the fire uh so uh, so, so so the 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 oxygen uh, declines from its ambient 21 percent to probably something like 10 or five. And if you were to take 170 degree uh, uh, organic matter, hydrocarbons, and blow it with 21% oxygen, yeah, it might just catch fire. Especially if your uh, your pile contains 
uh, yard scraps, like that lignin and that sort of thing. That would be more likely to catch fire. Mine is mostly manure and a little bit of some, some, some sawdust in there, but it's not likely to catch fire at higher temperatures. So we're safe. All of us in this room are safe in that regard. Now, infiltration. This is my, this was my original setup. And I, I noticed that the, the rear of the bunker was getting like maybe 90, and the front of the bunker was like 110, 115. I was absolutely disappointed. And I, I just didn't know what to do. So I took the course, the, uh, the, 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 the composter facility operator training, and I learned some things. So this is what my bunker became. It now has a superstructure on it. But you see those tubes? They have holes every eight inches. And I pile sawdust over top to create a, a, a plenum, a way to distribute the, the oxygen more evenly around the pile. So uh, that, that little plenum of, of, of wood chips is in there. And um, I'm sure the air flows nicely. I can't feel the draft, but it sure heats up good front to back. It's, it's absolutely incredible. I love it. This, uh, th that bunker was uh, 12 feet wide and 14 feet deep with four foot high walls, just in case you're wondering about that. Any questions? I have, uh, I have several slides that I, I took out. This was, this was a, this, this was a, a presentation that I did for the, Ever, uh, the Evergreen State College uh, for about three hours. And, and, and I'd be happy to, if, if you got something a little more technical, I, I could probably go to it. And we're gonna see some really cool stuff when you come to the farm. I'll tell you, uh, you know, I, I had to bite my tongue when Kelly was making a presentation because <laughs> I was just, I just wanted to expound further, but we'll save that for the farm. Oh, Adam, yes, sir. Unmute yourself. Hey, Bob, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you, Adam. Hi. Um, you had mentioned in the beginning, the beginning of the presentation, of the presentation. That you um, get horse manure um, from someone nearby. There's a lot of uh, uh, horse manure available in my area. One thing I've read is that a lot of horse feed is treated with herbicides and that can stay in the manure for multiple years. So in your process of vetting, were there certain questions or things or considerations that you went through in order to ensure that the compost that you were producing didn't have any of any bad things in it of that nature. Yeah, thank you. That was actually addressed in the in the in the WORC workshop. And you're talking about the chlorpyrrolid or the aminopyrrolid. Those are the like they're 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 not the forever, forever chemicals that are in the news these days, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's a leafy plant herbicide um, that stays around forever and just goes around the system. The good, the lucky break there is uh, the horse, uh, they're fed entirely alfalfa. Now, if you put a pyrrolid on alfalfa, it would die and the grass would live. So uh, I, I was fairly secure that I was not creating uh, a pyrrolid uh, contaminated compost. Now, if when, when I, I send my, my samples off to uh, uh, ANL, uh, 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 lab uh, for testing. And uh, one of the options you can say, hey, you want to look for a, a pyrrolid test? Well, the way they do a pyrrolid test is they plant peas. And because peas are, and other legumes are the chief victims of, of pyrrolid uh, uh, poisoning. And, and uh, I, my, my uh, rolling body farm and me have grown a lot of good peas with this compost. So we, we've done like seasons of empirical test without you know paying somebody else to to plant some peas and see if they wilt uh as they emerge from the ground so so i'm i'm, I'm pretty secure if uh somebody needed a pyrrolid test i'd say well you know here's the sample just just you know buy it feel free so I, i'm fairly secure in having clean compost can i add to that bob thank you for that surely so i included a really great a fact sheet in the resource list um, all about, it's from the U.S. Composting Council. It's all about understanding persistent herbicides in compost. But generally speaking, generally speaking, um, 
numerous studies have found that most herbicides rapid, rapidly degrade during the compost process. But what I like about this, this fact sheet is it has the decay rate, uh, safe concentrations of commonly used herbicides that may be found in common compost feedstocks and compost. So I'll, I can include that in the chat as well, but that's a really great consideration and just one to think of um, when you are sourcing feedstocks off your farm and getting to really know your feedstocks ahead of time. Yeah, the, in, in, in my my operation, probably the chief vulnerability that the Achilles heel, if ever ever it were found, would be straw, because straw is of course salvaged from wheat fields, uh, orchard grass. Nah, probably not. Uh, if you're feeding cows your orchard grass, you're probably not going to feed them straw. Uh, but but if, if you have a uh, a grassy sourced uh, feed, um, that would be uh, you, 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 you'd want to do some question asking on its source. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Sunshine. Other questions about troubleshooting some compost issues you may have. That was a great question from Tiffany earlier. Um, have, do folks have any questions about, um, yeah, let's troubleshoot anything. Yeah. Of course, my closing slide never changes. Hey, this is uh, Connor. Yes, Connor. Yeah, so I have been doing composting for, geez, it's been like four or five years. And I started out doing like the Ing Ing Ingram's method, the circles with fencing, mm -hmm. um, flipping or like moving them multiple times to get it up to heat. And that worked really well. I was able to like get finished composting compost that was very high quality but it seems like it's like very intensive to do that so I've started doing like windrows and sometimes they like just flop you know like they heat up nicely and then it'll just like slowly taper off and not not heat back up after I turn even though I've like checked on carbon and nitrogen levels and stuff I don't know Maybe yeah, I think that's what I got. Yeah, well, the, the 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 manure is fairly hot when I get over to the to the horse stable, but it certainly does not have a way to provide it oxygen. Um, and if someone has not, uh, uh, I have my finishing pile. Uh, I, I was delivering compost to the on farm uh, vegetable grower. And it was it was kind of chilly and a little moist out in the air, but this the steam came off the face. And my goodness, this stuff is seven months old since it arrived on site. And and I, 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 I've been wondering, is it is it is it like trying to cool off if you have a big pile of mud that's 150 degrees? It'll take a while to cool off, and not because the reaction is slow. But it's just this mass, and and my curing pile is about twenty feet wide and 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 five feet deep. So so it's it, it's pretty substantial. And so so if, if I ha I now have one hundred and forty degree, one hundred and thirty degree uh, compost, uh, it's probably not because the reaction has slowed. It's probably because it just takes a long time to cool off. Now, when you move from one stage to another, of course. Um, it cools up. I saw. I saw that in in in, in the in the batch forty three uh, uh, timeline, and so maybe the if you didn't have air on it and you moved it over, like you lost, you had maybe a little bit of air entrained while you moved it, but uh, it had basically run out of gas. Mm -hmm. Perhaps uh, that, that, that's just a that's just a hypothesis. Uh, I don't have the answer to that, but something you might imagine. Yeah, I'd add, Connor. That's a great question. I mean, there's more questions we have, right? It's like, what were your feedstocks? At what point were they in the process? Was the temperature changing? But it's definitely if that's happening, it's it's possible that there's an imbalance of oxygen or moisture causing the pile or your row to cool. Um, some things to do is if you're not manage if you're not taking temperatures, maybe you already are, but managing those temperatures. Um, 
going back to your moisture I'm squeeze sure. test, checking, mm -hmm. digging into your pile, just what, what is it, what does your moisture content look like? Um, you could do a bulk density test, which I, I'm, I'm including that in the resource list. It is a little bit more technical, but if you're really wanting to get into understanding the water weight of your compost pile by volume, you can do bulk density tests on your farm with a five gallon bucket and a and a, a scale, an average scale. Um, but that might help you understand like, oh, my water, my moisture content is way off. So going back to your, yeah, your original feedstocks and at what point in the compost process if you had already hit that 131 temps, I mean, maybe your compost is just starting to finish, like Bob said, running out of steam. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to address the, the, the water because uh, um, I, I, that, that, that compost that was not, um, the, 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 where, where the timeline uh, showed that it crashed, um, it, was, uh, it was not tarp and it was wintertime. So um, I, 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 I refined my process a bit. Uh, when I get manure in the wintertime, um, I, I make sure that I tarp it. And if I get manure in the summertime, it's dry as a bone. And I have to put a sprinkler on it set to like five minutes every four hours, something like that. And I go down and check it every day or two to make sure I'm not uh, running a, a brown creek over to the neighbor's house. So it's it, it, it's very different depending on the time of year, and I was I was delighted at the the rain that we're getting these days because I think the pile down in the down in the yard of uh, fresh manure was uh, beginning to dry out, had a crust on top. So so tomorrow I'm going to load that into its primary and let it let it roll. So the moisture moisture is a good good prospect uh, if, uh, if if it were dry if if it were uh, uh, un untarped. Um, it'll dry out quite a bit. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you for the advice. Thanks. Thank you. I did answer some questions in the chat, so thanks for utilizing the chat, but maybe we have time for one short, one more short question before we fill out our class evaluations. Yeah, so this is... Jerry, uh, we got logged off a little bit earlier, so I apologize if this was already addressed, but we're kind of breaking new ground for our farm here, and we have a ton of invasive weeds, um, canary reed grass, uh, European blackberries, buttercup, these types of things. And my question is, can those things be composted to a point where they're not going to come back? Um, how, how would you address that? Yeah, the temperature is everything in that regard. I saw a tip put out by Cornell University before I actually put the composting operation in. I was training myself up for it offline uh, or online. Um, and I saw this interesting table that uh, if, if you get above you know, 120 degrees or 100 degrees, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll kill the weed seeds in like uh, a week. And if you get above 120, you'll kill them in two days. And if you get above... 150 degrees, they'll be gone in four hours. So, so it, it, it's it's quite a relationship there between time and 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 temperature. So, uh, I would say that if, if you hit PFRP for the for the dura daily duration, those weed seeds are are composted. Mm -hmm. And I would add, I did respond. And, to and just to clarify, does that actually work with the uh, roots as well? Not just the seeds, but the actual roots of the plants and everything will be killed off at those temperatures? Well, if, if, if the roots are like knotty, uh, knobby, and they haven't been reduced in size, there's this thing called bioavailability that, that Kelly talked about. There's three aspects of bioavailability. One is particle size. And if you have a chunk of root in there, uh, it 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 might be uh, have a lot of uh, survivability in, 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 in if if the compost is not like many many weeks. Uh, another is is uh, uh, water availability. Like if it's if it's uh, if the water can't get into it because the the microbes actually live in the water. They don't live in dry stuff. They live in the water. And and like I have a. Uh, I have uh, the, 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 the manure that I get has fine sawdust in it, 
and uh, the, the plenum chips are larger chips. And so when my compost hits the curing pile, you see those chips, but you don't see the compost. You don't see the, 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 the fine sawdust. So bioavailability is a big deal. And if your roots are not particularly bioavailable, uh, they'll be there when you're when you think you're done. Mm -hmm. And about reed canary grass, I would I would highly um, recommend not adding the rhizomes of reed canary grass into your compost system unless it's super well managed. You said you're just starting out. Maybe wait till later. You have a system set up. That said, if you're cutting or mowing the reed canary grass, the green clippings are great. But you want to just be really careful about adding those rhizomes into your compost pile because they can, you know, even if they're cut, they can grow. And it's just such a noxious weed that um, if it's not well managed, it can um, spread. But like Bob said, if you get up to temperature and you're, you have your feed stocks well mixed and chopped and particle size and heat and moisture, you could do some experimenting, but just um, be advised to composting noxious weeds. And if you're new starting out, I highly recommend chatting with your noxious weed county coordinator, program coordinator. They're amazing. They're an educational resource. They can talk to you about each individual species of noxious weed and, and management and control before you throw it into your compost pile. So thanks. A little, little experience on, on that. Um, uh, the, 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 the horse stable has, has tansy ragwort um, all over the place. And I think I might go over there uh, this summer and just like start lopping the heads on. Um, and uh, because I, I, although tansy ragwort has never shown up in my compost, anybody has never ever mentioned it. We got the, uh, uh, we got the land spores that grow alongside the pile, but that's, uh, that's edible. Why not? Um, but uh, uh, his, his horses were working harder than my microbes. And so that we dumped a few loads out in the field and then I spread it with the tractor. And shortly after that, we have tansy ragwort. So it's in the manure. I know that, but I've never seen it in the compost. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that, okay. Bob. Thank you. So for those of you who want to continue um, talking about compost, please register for part two, the on-farm Dirt Talk Farm Walk at Bob's Farm. It's going to be a blast. We get to see his passive aerated pile system and windrows and his feedstocks. And we get to talk to his amazing farmer who is a uh, rolling bounty farm and growing amazing vegetables. So please register if you haven't already. Thank you for joining us. Please fill out the class evaluation. I put the link in the chat. We definitely, um, we use your, your feedback to show our commissioners, to show the state, to show WCU how important these opportunities are to our farmers and to our communities. So please take a few minutes and fill out that eval. I would very much appreciate it. Um, Bob, any closing comments? Thank you. Oh, uh, we, we, we've uh, I, I had to use a little, uh, little organizational um, uh, uh, chips, but we've scheduled some really nice weather for the 4th of June. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, thank you, everyone. Have a good night.